right, guys. Uh, this time we're talking about electric fields. Last time it was all about electric charges. This has everything in the world to do with electric charges, but it's not the forces between individual charges. It's the fields that are caused by the charges. All right, so let me tell you about that. An electric field is uh, a field in general is any space and at every space there is a vector associated with that point in space so like if you point at the doorknob in your room then your finger would make a vector where the direction is toward the doorknob and the distance will say is from the tip the distance from the tip of your finger to the uh, to the doorknob itself so there's a vector there and everywhere that you move in the room if you point at the doorknob you could have a doorknob field it would be a, a region where there's a vector at every point in that room uh, that measures how far it is to the doorknob and which direction the doorknob's in. This is the same kind of thing. It's called an electric field because we have that electric charge, and every point in the space has a vector associated with it. Uh, for example, right here, I could come in, and if I had a positive charge here, and I were to put a you know, if this is the point in space, uh, what we do is we use a small positive test charge. And if I put a small positive charge near this positive charge, then it's going to be repelled. And the direction would be that uh, direction. And the magnitude would depend on a calculation that I do that I'm going to show you down here at the bottom. If I put the, uh, the small positive test charge right here, it would be repelled and would go this way. And so every point in space, there is a direction and a magnitude, depending on how close we are, and it, it points radially outward. You put a positive charge there, all the electric field lines are going to point outward from that. On the other hand, over here, if you put a negative charge in, and I put my small positive test charge anywhere in that space say right here if this is positive and that's negative it will be attracted it will be pulled toward that and so all the field lines here point inward like so okay and we've drawn some of them there but you could draw a lot more um, that's the magnitude again the i'm sorry that's the direction the magnitude depends on how close we are and um this is probably the best thing to know about the electric field right there. It's the force divided by Q. Since, you know, we'll call this big Q and this would be little Q or something because it's that small positive test charge. Um, we're really kind of taking the force equation KQ1, Q2 over R squared and we're dividing out this force. I don't really have a charge there. I'm using this imaginary, this this hypothetical small positive test charge and we specify that it's small because we don't want to we don't want it to repel this guy we're not trying to do anything to this guy we're just measuring the effect of it out here or, or at any point in space that you you want to consider okay clearly the distance from uh, the charge to where I'm thinking about putting this imaginary small positive test charge matters that's R and uh, it's an inverse square law, so I got that under there. But uh, this is the uh, electric field due to a, a point charge, due to a single charge. All right. So it's pretty easy to calculate. It looks exactly like the force law, except we don't have that second charge because we haven't put a second charge there. We're just saying at that point, what would happen if I did put a charge there? Now, I've got this little comparison here. Um, we say the Earth has a gravitational field. And there's that word again. If I go out into space and I put an object here, then Earth's gravity is going to attract it that way. And for the astronaut, there would be a force right there that is generated by the field. Earth has mass, and that warps space-time, and all kind of weird stuff we don't really need to get into. But, uh, you know, as soon as I say, well, here's the mass of the Earth, and uh, here's the mass of the astronaut, 
I could find the gravitational force between the Earth and the astronaut. We had a formula that said that that's G, a constant that uh, Cavendish measured for us, times mass 1, in this case mass of the Earth, times mass 2, mass of the astronaut, divided by the distance squared. And that it was easy to calculate the gravitational force right there, just like we calculated the electric force. And notice here, this is kind of neat too, the electric force formula looks so much like what we're doing. We have a different constant. We're not uh, basing this on mass, it's on charge. But you see the similarity there? It's the same kind of formula. It's the same physics, if you will. Different force, different reason, but uh, but it's the same idea. Um, over here in the second picture, I've pulled the astronaut out. There's no astronaut there. But if I were to put an astronaut here, he would be attracted that way. That's the field. We haven't put the astronaut there yet. But if I put an imaginary mass there, then I know what would happen. It could be a hammer, it could be a shoe, a rock, whatever. Wherever I put this thing, at every point in space, I'm going to get a force due to this gravitational field. This is exactly the same thing here. Um, I have a charge. We'll do this one over here. I have a charge. That's kind of like the Earth. It's generating a field. And as soon as I tell you what this force is, or I'm sorry, what this second charge is, then we could calculate the force. But until I know what that charge is, all I can do is calculate the field. Okay? So, um, that's kind of where this part of the equation pops in. We already know how to calculate F. If we cancel out this small positive test charge that we're thinking about putting at every point in space, then I can calculate the electric field like that. Uh, notice I could take those three, multiply both sides by Q, and end up with F equals E times Q. So if I knew the electric field, then I could multiply by, well, I'm going to put a 2 coulomb charge there, whatever it is, and then bam, you'd, you'd get the force between the charge that was already there and this 2 coulombs that I put in. All right? And the distance is already built into the electric field and everything. But that's, that's what the electric field does. Um, we look at the maps of these lines and uh, we say, well, I have positive charge, so everything is directed outward. Or I have a negative charge and everything is pulled toward that point. We can get the magnitude from the formula. We get the direction by putting an imaginary small positive test charge there and thinking about which way a positive charge would be either attracted or repelled to the existing charge, to the one in the middle there. All right, kind of weird, but uh, makes sense, I hope. If not, uh, save me up a question for uh, recitation or something. We'll figure it out. Now, you remember how we did superposition of electric force? If I had two forces on a charge, uh, we learned how to add those as vectors. Well, the same thing happens with electric fields here. So, you know, if I take that small positive test charge and I put it right here, uh, is my S P D T uh, T C? I can't even spell. Yes, small positive test charge right there. Okay, I'm gonna put a little plus sign just to remind me, but it's it's understood to be positive. Um, now I have a charge here. Why don't we call that one Q1? And over here I have a second charge Q2, and both of those are causing an electric field right there. I need to consider both of those. This guy is negative. So a positive charge would be attracted to that, and that would be one part of my, uh, you know, why don't I want to call that E1. Meanwhile, this is positive, this is positive, there will be a repulsion, and I'll get a second electric field right there, E2, and I need to add those two vectors. That would be the superposition of electric fields. And... Um, that would be the uh, thing I could do there. Now, if I, if I put my small positive test charge right here, it's going to be attracted to that one and repelled from this guy. All right? So those two would go together. Uh, normally, what we would do there is just kind of trace out the line. 
and say I've got a whole line that that thing could follow like that. Or if I put a, a small positive test charge right here, it would be repelled from the plus sign and then eventually attracted over to the negative sign. So we get uh, a set of lines that looks like that. That's usually called a bipole. I have two poles, positive and negative, and, and my lines come like that. Well, what if I had some kind of different charge distribution? Here's a positive charge. Here's a second positive charge. So pick any point in space doesn't matter. Uh, if I pick right here for my small positive test charge, positive, positive, there's a repulsion. So it's going to try to get away from this guy. It's also trying to get away from this guy. So he's going to kind of follow the line that looks like that. Uh, if I put it right here, it's experiencing an electric field this way. And this guy is pushing that way on it. Not quite as strong because he's farther away, but uh, you can see how I'd get a, a field line that does like that. And so this would be, uh, you know, with two positive charges, I would get a, a thing that looks like that. Uh, here's a positive charge and a bar of iron that has negative charge all over it. This one's a little bit different. If I put a positive charge somewhere, it's going to be repelled from this positive charge and attracted over there. So uh, he's closest to the positive charge. That's going to be a really strong push away. But eventually he's going to get sucked into that over there. Here's a point. Now you're repelled from that, attracted to this, and it goes something like that. And you could just draw these lines everywhere you want to. Uh, it's just all of a different... Uh, Starting at a different point in space, you're going to get a different electric field line. All right, how about here? Here I've got two bars, and uh, if I put one here, this is positive, so it's repelled. Meanwhile, this one is negative. It's attracted. And see how I get these nice straight lines? Parallel electric field lines. So it just depends on how the, the real charge is distributed. And, of course, where I'm thinking about putting my small positive test charge. Superposition. Find the individual parts, add them as vectors, and you got it. We want to do a couple of these here. Um, this one is not a field problem. This is the force problem that we did in the last video. And uh, if you remember what we did there, um, we said there was a negative charge here and a positive charge here. And we wanted to know what the force on Q3 was, I'll just say F3, uh, something like that, okay? That was looking for forces, and remember we kind of had a process for that. Up here we had to find the force that charge 1, where is my, there it is, uh, find force 1, and so we did that. Find force 2, that was step 2, and we did that, and then we had to add the two vectors. Okay, and we've already seen that. It's on the last video, so you can go back and look at it if you want to. But uh, this is a very similar process. Um, this time around, I'm not looking for the force. I'm looking for the field. But it's a it's identical process. I want to come in here and I want to find the electric field due to charge one, and then I'm going to find the electric field due to charge 2, and then I need to add the vectors. And hopefully I've left enough room there to do that. Uh, E1 is not hard to find. I'd come in here, remember the formula, K, Q1, over R1 squared. I have those numbers. K is 9 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Q1, I'm looking right here at the blue charge. I got negative 0 0.04 coulombs. Again, I already know the direction. I didn't tell you about it. I should have. But I'm going to leave the negative sign out. So I'm going to just put 0 0.04 coulombs. Downstairs, I need the distance. It says that R1 is 0.8 meters. And remember from the formula, I got to square that. 
So that would look like this. Okay, let's calculate the magnitude and then I'll tell you all about the, uh, the direction, although I think you can see where it's, it's going here. Uh, 9e9 times 0 0.04 divided by 0.8 squared would give me a magnitude of big number. Okay, and uh, that is 5, 6, how am I ever going to remember all that? 5, 6, 2, 5, and a bunch of zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros. Okay, now we had two choices there on the units, and I didn't really bring that up like I probably should have. So let's go back here, um, up here at the top. I can measure electric fields in either newtons per coulomb. Well, that makes sense, because if I take this right here, the force would definitely be in newtons, and the charge would definitely be in coulombs. So newtons per coulomb makes perfect sense. Uh, we can change that to volts per meter if you want. but uh, And I'll show you the unit conversion on that. For right now, let's just stick with newtons per coulomb. Okay, so I'm going to put that on, on our work over here. And I uh, swear. Uh, there we go. Newtons per coulomb. The unit, I, I kind of like the unit on that because it really does tell what happens. This is the point P where we're thinking about putting the charge. And, you know, you could pick any other point that you wanted to. But, but uh, for this point P, here's a negative charge. So I'm going to get an attraction. I'm going to get uh, an electric field that would seek to pull a positive charge to the left. Now, I, haven't put a, I haven't put a charge there yet. This is all hypothetical. What would happen if I did put a positive charge there? Well, it would be pulled this way. And the electric field measures that. How much does it pull? Well, it depends on how much charge I put in. If I put in two coulombs, see how the coulombs will cancel? And I would end up in newtons. So that's telling me, as soon as I know what uh, charge you want to drop in at point P, then those coulombs are going to cancel and I'll be back to, to force. And that makes sense because we said that the uh, force was equal to the electric field times Q. All right. So, uh, you know, we can kind of work this thing both ways. You give me the force, I can tell you the field. If you tell me the field, I can tell you the force. All right. As soon as you tell me what, what kind of charge it goes here. I need a direction. We're trying to find a vector. This should be a vector. So that means I need a direction. And you can see the direction down here in our picture. This uh, a, a positively charged par particle at uh, point P would be attracted to the left. Uh, we like to start measuring 0 degrees right there. Measure around counterclockwise to the left would be 180. So I'm going to put uh, that big number at an angle of 180 degrees like that. And so now we have, we have done that. I'm going to scoot this up. Oh, dear. Make sure I have enough room here. It's not going to let me do it, is it? All right. There we go. So uh, next step would be to find E2. Well, that's the same process we just went through, except now I'm thinking about what the second charge is doing to it. So I come down here to the, to the red charge. We took care of this one. Now we've got to consider the effect of this one. Q2 is 0 0.02 coulombs. And uh, there's a distance between point P and Q2 of 0.6 meters. So those are the numbers that I need to put in here. All right, 9E9, Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Uh, my charge is 0 0.02 coulombs. And my distance is 0.6 meters. Don't forget to square it. I'll come down here. Get my calculator back out, which I moved over there. And now we need to do 9E9 times 0 0.02 divided by 0 0.6 squared. And there's another big number. Okay, it's all fives, repeating fives. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of them. All right, write some, some version of that down.
And again, it's Newton's per Coulomb uh, right there. You can see that this uh, Coulomb is going to cancel one of those like that. Right here I have a meter which gets squared. So my meter squared is going to cancel the meter squared up here. And there's all that's going to be left is a Newton on top. <sighs> Newton on top and a Coulomb on the bottom. There's my Newton per Coulomb. Like so. All right. Uh, sadly, we're not quite done yet. Uh, now I have two vectors, except I haven't specified the direction on the second one. I um, haven't even thought about the direction of the second one. Here's my uh, real charge, positive charge there. I'm thinking about point P putting a small positive test charge there. There will be a repulsion, so it's going to push it this way. And we were told in the problem that that's a 35 degree angle. Uh, that's what I want to put right there like that. Okay, so now I have two vectors. I need to add the vectors. Uh, you know how to do this. I'm going to go through real quick, but I'll be happy to do more of these in class. Uh, R sub X would be equal to big number, first big number, uh, cosine 180, plus the second big number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, cosine 35. Uh, we use the cosine first in order to get the um, x component of the resultant. So I'm going to put uh, 5, 6, 2, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, I think I got them all. Uh, cosine 180. And close up the cosine for heaven's sake. And then I've got a bunch of 5s. There's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of them. Cosine 35. And if I did everything right, and if I've got my calculator in degrees like I should, uh, if I hold my tongue just right, then there is the answer. It's a negative number, which is interesting. That would indicate that the x component is to the left. And sure enough, um, you can see here that uh, this blue charge being twice as big as that one. They're close to the same distance apart, but... He's got twice as much charge, so there's going to be more pull. And that uh, that green arrow represents the resultant. Definitely going to the left, uh, like we're showing here. So I'll scoot that off and put that into my uh, thing here. R sub X came up uh, negative 5169915554, let's call it. All right. Step two would be to do the same thing with the Y uh, components. Um, you can see that the blue one is not pulling left. I mean, it's not pulling up or down at all. It's all in the, in the X direction, negative X direction. Meanwhile, E2 is to the right and up. So I do have an upward component there. Um, I'm just going to uh, change my cosines out for sines. Remember where we put the cosine here and here? If I change those to sines... Then I'll have my thing. So I'm going to go second enter, stroll up here, and hit sign. Come get the one down here. Whoops. Hit sign. And there's the next number that I need. That is the Y component. That's how much uh, the electric field, the strength of the electric field in the Y direction. And if I could find, there it is. <sighs> Too much open. All right. Uh, notice it is a positive number. We said that uh, the second one's pulling up, but the other one's not at all. So the only, only direction is that upward part right there. All right. So that is uh, what we got here. And that would be the X and the Y component. It's pulling the first big number to the left and the second big number up. I need this line. I need the result and I need the, the hypotenuse there. So the Pythagorean theorem comes handy, comes in handy at that point. And I'm going to just put uh, R sub X squared plus R sub Y squared rather than writing all those numbers again. And I'll get my calculator here and uh, we can go square root 
of the first one. I'm leaving out the negative sign because I'm just about to square it and it's going to go away. Okay, and don't forget to square that one. All right, maybe I got everything in there just right. If so, this would be my number. And uh, I'm going to slide it off so I can write this down and still look at it. Uh, right there, I've got uh, 517972262652 uh, or something like that. Um, remember, this was in Newtons per coulomb. Um, that's a huge number, but uh, what you know what that says is if I went and put a whopping one coulomb charge right here, then I would expect there to be a whole lot of force right there. One coulomb uh, charge is going to make some trouble, and uh, you know you need to need to plan for that. So yes, it will be a big number, and that's okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to know the direction of that, so the last step would be to come in here and say, fine, I want the angle, and um, why don't I call that phi for right now, and then we'll come back and save tangent for the, uh, the angle that we really want. Remember that uh, I need to do the arc tangent of the y component over the x component. It's always y over x. So when I do that, here's my y component, here's my x component, and uh, we'll go second tangent, this number, 31 million something, divided by the x component. Again, I'm going to leave the negative sign out. I already know the direction. Negative sign only indicates direction. So let's uh, just make short work of this okay and that comes up three and a half degrees if I didn't write the wrong number down somewhere or do something silly okay that is this angle and if you remember your vector addition from first semester physics that is not the angle we want we said that it goes to the left and up, and, and the arc tangent's always going to give us the angle between those. Uh, but I actually need to come in here, measure around that way. I'm in the second quadrant, so I need to say theta. The angle that I want is 180 minus 3.5. And, a half. and uh, that would be 177, 176.5 degrees for my angle. So... Now I could write the whole thing as a vector. There's my magnitude. This is my direction. And the whole thing, the electric field at that point, would be 5179726 newtons per coulomb at an angle of 176.5 degrees. And that's what we want. Superposition. Whole lot of fun there. Get your individual vectors. Um, I had two charges here. One, two. And I'm thinking about what they do to this point. So I'm going to have to find two electric fields using the little point, point charge formula. That gives me two vectors. And then i got to add the two vectors. All right. If you want a little refresher on adding vectors, uh, just, just let me know. And after class someday or on Zoom, uh, just you and me will... We'll, I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Um, I was telling you that uh, as soon as you knew the electric field, it was real easy to find the, the force. And this is a good example of that. Uh, here's two parallel plates. And you remember what the electric field looked like on this thing. Um, I'm going to get some green lines going here and, and we'll draw those in. If I put a small positive test charge here, it will be... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. This is an electron that we're putting in. So we're actually putting in a negative charge here. My electric field lines, I always use a small positive test charge for uh, my field lines. If I put a small positive test charge there, it's going to be repelled by this and attracted to that. So I'm going to get field lines. Dang. 
that go this way. Repelled by the blue line, attracted to the red line. And those are going to run nice and parallel, smooth, like this. Uh, when you get to the outside, there will be some bulging like that. All right, but we're mostly interested on this middle part inside here. Now, we're going to talk about capacitors eventually. Uh, effectively, what you have here is a capacitor or a parallel plate. Uh, different... Uh, names for this but um, that's that's what we're our first look at one of these I guess here's my electron that is a negatively charged object so I'm gonna put a little negative sign there if I can can't okay uh, negative charge will be repelled from the negative side attracted to the positive side it's going against the electric field and when I want to find the force all I have to do is multiply the charge times the electric field the charge of an electron is 1.610 to the negative 19 coulombs. Talked about that on the last tape. Uh, right here, that's the electric field. And here they've used 10,000 volts per meter. That would be the identical number to 10,000 um, newtons per coulomb. And I think somewhere in this is, yeah, uh, we'll see the, uh, the conversion right there. So I'm going to go ahead and put in... There's the 10,000, written in scientific notation, volts per meter. Works out to uh, that many newtons of force. And here's the gory details on this, the part that you needed to know anyway. Um, when I just do it this way, I've got coulombs times volts divided by meters. So that's what we're starting with here, a coulomb volt per meter. The unit conversion that you need to know is that right there. So I'm going to write it in here. One volt equals one joule per coulomb and when I substitute that in you can see that the coulomb is going to cancel I've got a joule per meter which is what's written here then I dissemble take apart the joule uh, joule is a newton meter over the meter and the meters are going to cancel and I end up with my my uh, force of one newton uh, Force should be a vector quantity, so it would probably be good to say that that's at an angle of 180 degrees, that is to the left, like uh, because I'm putting a negative charge in there, that's the direction it's going to move. All right. Uh, they also ask us to find the acceleration of this electron. Uh, we did something like this last time too, but uh, don't forget your first semester of physics. F equals ma. I have the force. I can look up the mass of an electron. So it's not too hard to get the acceleration there. Divide both sides by m. You got this. There's the force that we just found, this number. So we're taking that and plugging it in for f. Uh, here's the mass of the electron thing that we look up. Of course, I'd give you that number on the test or something. But when I divide, uh, I get a whopping 1.8 times 10 to the 16 meters per second squared for the acceleration. That's, that's a, a huge acceleration. Uh, because it's, it's not much force, but it's on a little bitty object like an electron. All right. I uh, wanted to do a couple problems here that you usually see in physics books. Um, you know, these electric fields can do all kind of neat things. Uh, in this one, they're taking a little bitty piece of cork. Uh, cork is interesting because A, it's lightweight, and B, because it'll hold a charge. And um, So there's a couple reasons they... They like cork. But um, let's say that's the piece of cork right there. All right. We want to float this thing in the air. And we're going to do that with an electric field. I'm going to draw the table down here just to remind myself that this thing is in the, uh, in the air. And any kind of problem like this, what you need to do is to draw a force diagram. If, if there's a problem that has forces in it, or if something is held steady, or it's in equilibrium, or it cancels out, or any of those words, uh, what they really want you to do is to come in here and say, gee whiz, gravity is trying to pull this thing down. And I know that gravity, I can calculate the weight of the object just, just with mg. Huh, look at that, they gave me the mass. Okay, so... 
um, you know, that's that's a pretty good indication that mass is going to play a part in this somewhere. The more massive it is, then the harder it is it's going to be to hold it up. So I would need more electric field. The electric field, the force generated by the electric field then, needs to cancel out the gravity so this thing just floats in the air. So I'm going to put right here Fe, the electric force that is generated by the electric field, uh, we know that the force is equal to Q times the electric field. That's what they're asking for. What electric field do I need? So see how we had to kind of wrangle that around and, and get the electric field in there? Got to draw the force diagram so that you know all the parts and pieces. And of course you know that uh, Newton would have you come in and write this down, right? Anytime there's forces, this is where we want to go with it. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. I see two forces. I've got the electric field minus uh, mg. And in this case, I want the acceleration to be zero. I want it to cancel out. So the electric field is equal to the weight. That makes sense. Those two should cancel out so that it stays steady, so that it stays where it is. Uh, the electric field is given by... Q E sub F, that's equal to MG, just copying the right hand side. Uh, my assignment was to find the electric field. So if I divide both sides by Q, then I've got uh, the strength of that electric field. And you can come in here and put the units in, I mean the numbers in, that's fine. Uh, the mass was 2 grams. Of course, we don't like grams. So I would put that into kilograms. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. And right there you can see why we don't like grams. What would a gram meter per second squared be? That's uh, not what we do. We, we're looking for a newton. Okay. Q is the, is the charge on the piece of cork. Uh, that's given right here. So that's 5 times 10 to the negative 7 coulombs. And it's ready for the calculator. That wasn't too bad. Uh, draw a force diagram. Sum the forces. Set it equal to 0 if it's stationary. Okay. So I need an electric field equal to 39,200. And then I've got two choices. I could either say newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. Uh, you want to see the newton per coulomb? Here's a kilogram. There's a meter per second squared. A kilogram meter per second squared is a newton. And uh, uh, a coulomb's already on the bottom. So that's probably your best bet right there. But if you want to switch it over to the other, that's fine. All right. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this one isn't strictly a electric field problem. This is more an electric force problem. But uh, I thought I'd put this in here just so you could kind of see where this goes. Um, right here I've got uh, two strings that come down to two little balls. And this is, was a thing that people used to build all the time. And um, to, to measure charge, you could use this to demonstrate charge. So you could take a a plastic comb and comb your hair and build up some static charge and touch one of the balls and the two balls would repel. They would um, hold that charge that would generate a, uh, uh, an electric field and those would would push each other away. There would be electric forces between the, the balls that would hold them out at an angle like that instead of just gravity winning. Okay. Well there's obviously some forces going on there. So uh, we need to draw those forces in and think about what is pushing on these balls at any time. So I'm going to come in here. Why don't we start with uh, the easy one. Uh, gravity is pulling down. So that's supposed to be straight down. And I'll just put mg on there like that. Meanwhile, the tension it's kind of here at an angle. I'm kind of bending it a little bit more than just to make sure you understand it doesn't go straight up and down. And um, then the electric force between this charge and this charge is going to push 
each other apart. And so going straight sideways, try that one more time. I've got the electric force pushing that way. So three forces on each of the balls. I could come in and draw the same three forces over here, but that's that's what we're looking at. Maybe you just want to draw the ball. See, I got gravity pulling straight down. I got the string pulling at some angle. Here it's a small angle, five degrees, they say. And I've got the electric force repelling that from the other ball. So it would look like that. Well, it's certainly a two-dimensional problem. And you know that in any kind of two-dimensional problem, we've got to separate it into the x and the y direction. So I'll come in here and say this will be our x direction stuff. And over here, I'll put the y direction stuff like that. So when I sum the forces in the x direction, that's going to be equal to mass times the acceleration in the x direction. I don't want this thing moving. It's just stationary right there. It's not moving at all. It's a statics problem. I put a zero right there. And then eventually we'll get around to doing the same thing in the y direction like that. All right. It's not going up or down. It's not going left or right. So we've got that. I need to find the forces that are pushing left and right and put them here. And the forces that are pushing up or down, put them here. And uh, so that's my next job, is to go over here and get the X and Y components of this thing. Well, in the X direction, uh, this guy is certainly X direction, right? So that's going to be one of my... Oh, wow. Um... I can't even draw it in, but uh, all right, we're stuck with it. Um, T here is interesting in that it has, you know, this is all X, but T has a leftward pull. It goes up and left. This guy's pushing right. So my X components would be this and that right there. Um, now, remember your geometry here. If this is a five degree angle, if I create an upward line right there, this has got to be a five degree angle too. Uh, that would be, uh, what do they call that, opposite angles, opposite interior angles, or uh, you could think about it as two, a line that cuts uh, two parallels, a transversal, right? And the angle, there's just all kind of ways to do this. But this That'd be better to draw it that way. Those two both have to be five degrees. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call this a five, right here. Uh, this would be the opposite. This would be the hypotenuse. This would be the adjacent. So I can use sine and cosine to get those parts. Uh, the trig function that has opposite and hypotenuse would be sine. So if I write sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse like that. Uh, we are very interested in the opposite because that's the X component. So I'd multiply both sides by the hypotenuse. It would look like that. Um, the length of the hypotenuse is 50. Uh, not 50 degrees. Uh, it's 50 centimeters. Okay. And uh, let's go ahead and put that into meters, shall we? 0.5 meters times the sine of 5 degrees, uh, that's going to be the length down here. I'm kind of doing two things at once, so I apologize for that. Um, let's go ahead and get this, and then we'll, we'll get to the other part. Uh, I need that, that distance there. 0. 0.5 times the sine of 5 degrees. Okay, 0. 0.043, uh, that's about 4 centimeters uh, that's a distance right there. And maybe I'm carrying a little bit more than I, I need. Um, that actually would be 3, 5, 7. I got, I got my things backwards. Let me fix that. Um, that would be the opposite. That would be that distance right here. I'm going to have to have that 
because when I come around to calculating the electric force, I need to know this distance and call it R. So we just found half of R, all right? That kind of is important. In fact, actually, let me just go ahead and say, uh, go ahead and get that, that whole thing there. All right, two times the last answer would be 0 0.087. We'll just chop that off right there, I guess. Okay, we're going to need that in a little bit, so hold on to that one. All right, um, for the same reason, though, when I'm looking for the X component, it's opposite the 5 degree angle, and by this same argument, opposite the hypotenuse, the... Uh, in this case, the uh, when I'm thinking about the the uh, find T sub X, the the X component of the tension, then I'd have the sine of five degrees equals uh, T sub X, the opposite, over um, the hypotenuse, which is T. So I could just come in here and say T sine five degrees equals T sub X. And that's one of the forces that I need up here. So I'm kind of doing two things with sine there. All right. Uh, this is the part that pulls to the left right there. So I'm going to put negative T sine 5 degrees. This guy pushes to the right. So I'll put plus F sub E. I'll put a little X to say I'm just interested in the X component, but... Uh, there is no Y component, so we could just leave that out if we wanted to. All right. I uh, might have made a mess out of that, so let me see if I can fix that. I'm looking for X components. Um, right here, the tension pulls to the left. Tell you what, I'm going to draw a little picture right here. Okay. There's my the uh, this little charge ball. And I've got T sub X, which pulls to the left, which is uh, we found to be T sine 5 degrees, negative because it's left. Meanwhile, I've also got uh, the electric force pushing it to the right. So that's what I've got right there. It's all in the X direction, so I didn't really have to do that. But it uh, would look, look like that. All right, I'm going to see if I can get rid of some of this stuff just to make a little bit of room. That's the hard way to do that, isn't it? Did I not select? Oh, man. All right, I don't care for that, but it's where we are. Okay. Um couple things that I don't know there, but there is some stuff that I can fill in. So let's, uh, let's get busy and do that. Um, keep going here. This would be negative T times the sine of 5 degrees. I didn't do anything there. Uh, the electric force, I know all about that. That's KQ1, Q2 over R squared. So we're going to put that in right there. Uh, we could do this several ways. I'm going to add this first term to both sides. I get KQ1, Q2 over R squared equals T sine of 5 degrees. And uh, we could cross multiply right there. Also remember that both of these have the same charge. Q1 is Q, Q2 is Q. So these being the same, uh, this time I'm, I'm around I'm just going to write KQ squared multiplying both sides by r squared so i'll get t r squared sine of five degrees um, i don't know what t is i do know what r is right i can put that in uh, the whole thing here is what's what's q so clearly i don't know what q is either k i got that uh, but there's two unknowns there i can't solve that equation with two unknowns so we're kind of stuck i got r I know the sine of 5 degrees. I'm good with K, but I don't know Q. I don't know T. Well, when you get stuck, that's when you got to come through and build another equation. So right here, I'm going to think about the up and down forces on this thing. And if you want to just draw a separate picture, here's that charge. Gravity is pulling down. 
and the, the tension has an upward component like that, which I'll call T sub Y. And those cancel out. So two forces in the Y direction. I'm going to write uh, T sub Y minus MG equals zero. Um, let's go ahead and put MG on the other side. Uh, by the same argument right here where the X component was T sine 5. This is going to be T times the cosine of 5. And uh, I'm trying, trying to get T. So if I take uh, MG and divide by cosine 5, then I'll have uh, that. Well, fortunately, I do have M, and of course I know G. So we can put those numbers in, get T, put that in over here, and then the only thing we won't know is Q. All right, see how that works? Uh, these balls are 5 grams each, so I'm going to put 0 0.005 kilograms. G is 9.8 meters per second squared. Down here is cosine of 5 degrees. And we're ready to get a number on that. We'll put 0 0.005, 9.8, divided by the cosine of 5. And there's a number right there. The tension in that string is 0 0.0492. Uh, we didn't expect very much. There's just a 5-gram ball on the bottom of it. Okay, so uh, looks like that. All right, but now I can bring that over and plug it in right there. And as soon as I have that, then my only unknown is Q. Dang. And I'll solve for that, all right? So let's divide both sides by K. And take the square root while we're at it, because I'm about out of room here. And so this would be T R squared sine 5 degrees divided by K. I've got all those numbers, but not a whole lot of room. So let's uh, do the best we can here. I need to do a square root of the tension, 0 0.0492 times r squared. We worked up r right there. 0 0.087. That distance has to be squared. Uh, next up I need the sine of 5 degrees. Close up the sine and divide by k which is 9 times 10 to the 9. And I get 6.005 times 10 to the negative 8. Something like that. All right. Um, that's a small charge, but I wouldn't expect a huge charge on, I mean, that's still a pretty good charge, actually, but I wouldn't expect, you know, four coulombs on a little five gram ball. That would be, uh, these things would just blow apart and go on the opposite sides of the room or something. So I'm going to put six times 10 to the eight, negative eight um, coulombs for Q right there. Okay, uh, looking back real quick at it, I see there's something pushing this apart. I need to think about the forces. Uh, that means I need to draw a force diagram. And I say that the, the electric force is repelling. The tension's holding it up. The gravity's pulling down. It's a two-dimensional problem. I know i got to do Newton's law. Some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Because it's a two-dimensional problem, i got to break it into x and y. And get all those parts and pieces there. Uh, the X components, make sure they cancel out. And it doesn't move left or right. Get the Y components, make sure it doesn't move up and down. And just solve for the unknowns. Keep going until it works out. All right. Uh, that's today's discussion. Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with me there. And uh, we'll be back next time.